Uh, let's try to talk briefly, which is very difficult, about anti-Semitism and our struggle against anti-Semitism, our war against it. And uh, that, <laughs> the way that most people would interpret that, that sort of statement is not the way that I would, I mean it. And it'll become clear exactly the way I do mean it. Now, this is prompted by our friend Sven Longshanks at Radio Aryan, who is an indefatigable advocate for our people, both in his own country of Britain and worldwide, and especially in all of our, our countries, places that we formerly occupied as our native lands and the diaspora overseas, which are under assault, uh, mostly spiritually and culturally, but also uh, politically and racially. So our friends in Britain have the great misfortune to live under a totalitarian center-left neoliberal order. We know it's totalitarian because they don't just care about what you do, they care about what you say and what you think, and they seem dedicated to using police power to regulate basic speech in the public sphere. So you are not allowed to deviate from their secular humanist orthodoxy, and if you do, you will be visited by the police, you will be intimidated, and there is a likelihood that they will frame you for crimes, arrest you, jail you, imprison you, and persecute you. Okay, so all of these things, and these are being done, by the way, against the native population, not against an invasive foreign element that's corrosive to the structure of, of the, the native structure of the society itself. It's not against any of that. It's against the native indigenous population of the place in their own folk ways. And it's a revolution that's been going on for over 200 years. It's just particularly noticeable today. So our friends in Britain live in this very hostile environment and therefore they have to make a choice. Are they gonna come out full bore, really hot, say what they wanna say, and then be censored and imprisoned? Or are they gonna try to finesse their message and aim it somewhere within the Overton window, as far right within the Overton window as they can but also taking in mind the repressive measures of the regime. And so this is what our friend Sven Longshanks does at Radio Arian. He has to manage all these different concerns and he has to deal with the fact that he's running a, uh, a radio station located at a website where he can always be reached. It's a permanent home. He has control of it. He has ownership of it. He's not making comments on someone else's service. He's running this thing himself. And so that, on its own makes you more reliable, but it also makes you more exposed because you're taking complete ownership of this place, and therefore, in this environment, you have to you have to work within the law if you don't want to risk going to jail. So anyhow, you can have disagreements about what he says or the way that he says it, but you should just be aware that there are reasons. And if our good friends and our racial kinfolk in the United Kingdom had freedom of speech, they would be saying exactly what all white people across the world are saying. Because they're so similar to us, that they have the same concerns, they have the same problems. Now, all that being said, he's made a two, three, or four part series about anti-Semitism. And the approach that he has taken is that we are not anti-Semites and we are opposed to anti-Semitism because we are not battling these enemies because of hatred, but we're battling them simply in terms of environmental competition between subspecies or different organisms, right? So there's really no, uh, there's no even need for hatred to be involved therefore there shouldn't be. And that if we don't involve hatred, then we can't be considered to be anti-Semites. Now, 
you can see where he's coming from, but I will submit to you that it's not actually possible to get away from the label of anti-Semite, no matter what you do, no matter how you present yourself, no matter what arguments you make. Because there are so many problems with the concept itself. The concept of anti-Semitism itself is so fraught with difficulty that there's no way that you can get away from it. Now, the one part, the first problem, the power of problem of practical politics, is that we do not control media discourse. The people who control media discourse ultimately have the power to define the word in common usage. Now, if you look at the International Holocaust Remembrance uh, Foundation's working definition of anti-Semitism, or whatever that damn thing is called, it says that anti-Semitism is, quote, a certain attitude or a certain tendency of an attitude that may be expressed as hatred. So they don't even limit the definition of anti-Semitism to hatred. It doesn't even need hatred. Hatred's not even a part of it. It may include hatred, but it doesn't necessarily include hatred. Okay, so what is it? It's a rhetorical or physical manifestation of a certain tendency or attitude or viewpoint of Jews. Okay, so it's either a verbal or physical uh, manifestation, something that's done against Jews, but the something has not even been defined. So ultimately, what we're really talking about is criticism, okay, or anti-Jewish action. Now, they then say that it could be limited, uh, it's not even limited to Jews, in fact, they say in their own definition that it can be action or uh, rhetoric, you know, verbal or physical manifestations against non-Jewish people, right? So Jewish allies, presumably. Then, it, then it's not even against people, it's also against property. Then it's not only against people and property, but it's also against institutions, okay? Either cultural or religious. So basically, if you take any action or any speech that is in any way critical of Jews, Jewish allies, Jewish institutions, cultural or religious, or Jewish property, you are engaging in anti-Semitism. Now, there is no uh, way to reconcile that kind of definition with anything objective. It is totally subjective, and that's the way they want it. So, for the first issue, the issue of practical power politics, um, you're never going to be able to have yourself um, uh, even neutral, even neutral towards Jews. There's only two options. I don't know if it was if it was Winston Churchill who said in World War II something like, there are no neutral countries. And if he didn't say it, he certainly believed it. If he didn't say it, he certainly believed it. There are no neutral countries. Either you're a friend of the Jews or you are their enemy. And this is why every United States president, most governors, a bunch of senators, a lot of different people have to go to Israel and they have to put on a kippah or a yarmulke and they have to swear fealty at the Western Wall. They have to go up to it. They have to nod their head. They have to kiss it. They have to do whatever it is that they do. And so um, there are no there are no neutrals. You're either pro-Jewish or anti-Jewish. And if you're, if you're neutral or you actually take a strong stand against them, you're definitely going to be an anti-Semite. You're going to be labeled as such. And there's no way that you can get away from it. Okay, so that's the first issue. The second issue is the term itself, as it's constructed from these, these particles, they don't really make any sense. Anti means you're against. And Semite refers to either a linguistic, racial, geographic, or cultural group of people from the Near East. Okay, in North Africa. 
from, you know, like Ethiopia to the Arabian Peninsula up to Mesopotamia, um, over into Egypt and, you know, northern North Africa. So that sort of area is the Semitic or Semi area. Now, Jews, okay, the group of people that we currently know today as the Jews, a lot of them aren't Semites at all. Um, the prevailing view is that they are a mixed race population of people from uh, the Mediterranean, okay, so they're a mixture of Italian and Greek women who are not Semites, they're mostly the descendants of, uh, what is it, they're um, early Neolithic farmers, okay, mixed with some, you know, northern uh, Aryan uh, uh, composition, okay, so those two, those groups mix together and form these Mediterranean people. Then you get these guys from the Near East who are probably Semites. They go over and mix with these, these women from the Mediterranean. And then later on, you get an even additional mixture from Northern Europe, from Western Europe, and from Eastern Europe. So something like 80% of modern Jews are descended uh, you know, not even more than 50% from Semitic populations. And that doesn't even include the other theories, like the Khazar theory, which I don't subscribe to, but that's even an additional component. So again, there's very little connection even between the stupid name of this stupid concept, anti-Semitism, because there are plenty of Arabs out there who are anti-Jewish and are definitely not anti-Semite being Semitic themselves. So it's a stupid name. We should call it anti-Jewish, right? Anti-Talmudic, anti-Jewish, anti-Pharisaical. Those things would make a lot more sense. But no, we're stuck with this word because again, it injects more ambiguity into the concept. It makes it harder to pin down. It makes it more confusing. And that allows the people who have control of the media they have uh, additional opportunities to employ this concept, the stranger, weirder, and less consistent that it, that it is. It's uh, more opportunities for them. So that's, that's why that happens. Um, let me run an errand real quick, and then I'll come back and we will talk about the third and most important um, objection to the entire concept of so-called anti-Semitism itself. Now, the biggest problem about anti-Semitism is that in order to accept it, you have to either be a liberal humanist whose mind is diseased with the theories and ideology of the French Revolution, that's, that's one case, or two, you have to be a hypocritical Jewish nationalist. Those are really the only two options. Otherwise, you can't you can't even get involved in this sort of thing. So let, let's take these one at a time. Now, the ideas behind the French Revolution quickly mutated and formed into this monstrous thing that we have to deal with today called liberalism. And it's the idea, liberal humanism particularly, it's the idea that you shouldn't look out for your family, your clan, your tribe, your nation, or your race, and instead you should look out for all humans. You should look out for the international and global and universal brotherhood of all mankind. You shouldn't worry about different religions. You shouldn't worry about different skin colors as though that's all that race is. Of course not. You shouldn't look out for any of those things you should instead work for the benefit of all mankind. Now, this is the official ideology of Freemasonry, okay, it's particularly the Grand Orient Freemasonry. And what we know from doing research on those people is that a lot of them are blood-sucking, vampiric lawyers and capitalists, and they don't actually believe in liberal humanism. They simply use that ideology to step over problems and to use that as a way to get into power. So in the same way that Lenin and the early Bolsheviks said, we really care about workers and we care about farmers and peasants and soldiers, and then as soon as they got into power, they ruthlessly exploited all of those underclass groups 
they expropriated and, and exploited all of those people that they said that they cared about. It's the exact same way with these Freemasonic types, these liberal humanists, is that the leadership of these groups say that they care about equality and they care about all these different races and they believe everybody's in a global brotherhood. And as soon as they get in power, it's all about economic exploitation and the destruction of cultures for these people's benefit, for the benefit of a small elite. And of course, that's why Freemasonry and Marxism go so well together and work together is because they have a lot in common. Now, in both cases, there are real, true-believing, hardcore Marxists who actually believe the ideology, and the same thing goes for these Freemasons, okay? And these are the people that you're going to be arguing against, hopefully, is these low-level people, because there's no point in arguing against a high-level Marxist or a high-level Freemason because they don't believe what they're saying anyway. It's totally instrumental to them. They don't care. But, but, uh, like the hero of the 20th century did, maybe you're so great that you can go out and talk to millions of low-level Marxists and convince them that there is actually a way to help the worker. You can actually help the underclass without destroying the nation, without destroying national culture, without dividing the people against itself. This has been shown to be true, so maybe you can go do that, and I'll, I'll help you to also. We'll talk about these ideas together. So, uh, after that little introduction, let's bring it back again a little bit. Um, ethnocentrism is what those two groups, those Marxists and those Freemasons, they look down on it. They say, you can't worry about that kind of stuff. But every single human group, every clan, tribe, race, nation, culture, everybody in existence up until the modern era, they were all ethnocentric. They all looked out for themselves first. And if there's a watering hole and there's not enough water for all the animals, what are you going to do? You're going to look out for your the animals of your own family first and then your species and whatever else. So this is, this is just fundamental to the existence of the world, and certainly to people, but also animals too. Non-human animals, I mean. So the idea that you're going to get rid of ethnocentrism is just preposterous and stupid. Uh, but we have, we have to show some people about that. Now, um, the, other, the other idea is that anti-Semitism is a specific instance of ethnocentrism, and ethnocentrism itself isn't wrong. It's only wrong when Jews are the ones who are suffering. This is the position of the hypocritical uh, Zionist, uh, Jewish nationalist, which most of our politicians and historians and leaders and all these things, they actually believe this. This is what, this is what they get their bread and butter from. So we'll say, for example, if you read, read some history book, like if you look at Carol Quigley or one of these big regime uh, mouthpiece guys in their history books, like, I don't know, Hugh Trevor Roper or Carol Quigley or, I don't know, Stephen Ambrose, any of these guys, if you go read their history books, they will take for granted that Germany and France or Germany and Poland or Germany and Russia or England and France, or the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth and Hungary, they'll say, yeah, there were problems, or England and Ireland, whatever, that there were legitimate grievances between these two groups, and it led to conflict. They'll accept that on principle, that this could have happened, and that there was a legitimate conflict between these two groups. Now, when we get to the issue of the Jews, it is always always anti, quote unquote anti-Semitism, which again is a case of ethnocentrism directed against Jews, it's always a case of a psychological pathology. It's an ill, mentally diseased mind of a few wackos who um, scapegoat the Jewish community. So what I'm telling you is that they preclude the possibility that there were ever any sort, any type, any reason for a legitimate economic, politi uh, political, social, or cultural um, conflict between Jews and another group. Even the Jews and the Arabs, right? That's, that's a really difficult one, and that's why the Palestinian stuff is such a, such a flashpoint 
that people pile onto because you can clearly see the Jews just pushing Palestinians out of land that they lived on for, you know, two or three hundred years. And it's very difficult to say that the Palestinians in that case were the victims of some sort of psychological pathology for being pushed out of their ancestral homeland. So, uh, what, what am I trying to say? I want to say that we have to deny the existence of anti-Semitism itself. And you're going to have to think about it, and you're going to have to come up with your own argument that convinces you best as to why this concept is stupid, why it shouldn't be used, why it shouldn't be employed, and why whenever anyone stands up and says something about anti-Semitism, you have an immediate response to totally undercut the issue. This is the only way out. You cannot convince people that you are not an anti-Semite, and as soon as you start talking about it, you're going on the defensive, and you're opening yourself up to continued attack by these people. Now, Sven Longshanks has done a very good job trying to recast this propagandistically in terms of the competition between groups. That's exactly what it is, and I completely agree with that. And having done that, I think the next step is to completely reject the idea of anti-Semitism itself and to say, I am not opposed to anti to uh, I'm not opposed to ethnocentrism and I don't care who suffers from it. Why am I not opposed to anti uh, to uh, ethnocentrism? I'm not opposed to ethnocentrism because I'm not a liberal and I'm not a humanist. And so I don't believe that we should all be working in the interest of the international, universal, global brotherhood of man. I'm not a Marxist, so I don't believe that we should all be working for the, uh, in the interest of the international working class at the expense of every nation, every national culture, and at the expense of anyone who works with their head rather than anyone who works with their hands. Although today the defining characteristic of Marxism seems to be an aversion to work and a focus on uh, the, um, uh, how would you say, the butchering of people's genitals and the dosing of everyone with strange amounts of, you know, um, uh, synthetic hormones and things like this. Anyhow, this is my statement. We have to totally undermine the concept. And you have to do that in a way that makes sense best to you. Get past that word. We can't win with that word. You can't defeat that word because you don't have control over that word. The definition is completely off the wall. It doesn't make any sense. So we have to move past it and beyond it. In the words of Jonathan Bowden, we have to step over that. We have to step over it and beyond it. And you know, when someone hears for the first time that you say, I'm not a liberal, I don't believe in liberalism, I don't believe in humanism, their mind is going to be blown because they are liberals and humanists without ever even made, having made a conscious decision to be so. They have taken it into themselves with their mother's milk, which is basically the television and the internet, mainstream media. They've accepted those ideas. They've accepted them through some sort of, you know, malformed uh, stuff about the American Revolution against King George and, you know, attacking the Bastille. They don't even know why they believe these things, but they do. And if you give them an alternative, maybe we can, maybe we can move a little bit forward or we can go backwards a bit and then go forward again. Okay. Thank you for your time.